everybody from, I guess, all over the world. Um, I'm Dr. Anne-Claire Salmas. I'm an assistant professor uh, at the Department of Sociology, Egyptology, and Anthropology at AUC. And I have the pleasure uh, to introduce um, our speaker tonight. So our speaker is Dr. Uh, Meredith Brandt. Dr. Brandt is an instructor uh, in the core curriculum and uh, rhetoric and composition department at AUC. And she is the co-director of the Wadi Aloudi expedition directed by Ket Litzke, Litzka, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, um, at California State University, San Bernardino. So Dr. Brandt's PhD is from the University of Toronto when she wrote her dissertation on the socioeconomic organization of votive pottery production at Abydos uh, in the New Kingdom, a metric analysis study. Dr. Brandt is also a ceramicist and her research uses pottery to address issues of labor and production in the ancient Egyptian economy. So uh, without any uh, delay, um, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I am really happy that there's so many people who are here. This is fantastic. Um, and for AUC students in particular, this is your spring break. So if there's any AUC students here, thank you so much for coming to a Zoom webinar during your spring break. Um, so my talk, Life at a Middle Kingdom Amethyst Mine, the Archaeology of Site 5, Wadi al Hudi, is going to focus on the Wadi al Hudi expedition. The expedition was founded by Kate Liska in 2014, and it's been ongoing every season. Um, and we found an extensive amount of archaeological sites. I think it's important to think of Wadi al Hudi not as a specific site, but rather a region. And you can see here it's around 35 kilometers southeast of Aswan. And we found sites dating from the Paleolithic period, the Middle Kingdom, Greco Roman, and the Arab period. So there are many sites, we found a total of 41. And this talk is gonna focus on one site in the Middle Kingdom, Site 5 mostly. There's been extensive previous work at Wadi al Hudi. Uh, we've known about it since 1917 when the geologist Labib Nassim went to Wadi al Hudi and saw the sites, saw the archeology span and made announcements about it. So he's the one who first told people about Wadi al Hudi in terms of archeology. span and then later, uh, Murray in 1940, another geologist, part of the desert survey of Egypt, made other notations about Wadi al Hudi. So it's kind of nice that this is an ancient mining site and modern miners were the ones who, who first brought it to everyone's attention. Wadi al Hudi is most synonymous, it's most strongly connected with Ahmed Fakri. And he went to the sites in 1940, in the late 1940s and he recorded a lot of rock inscriptions from the site. He really did a monumental effort to present the rock inscriptions, uh, mostly the textual ones, to a wider Egyptological audience. He was mostly interested in language, so he made sketch maps. So this is site five uh, that we'll be focusing on later. And he wrote small amounts of archeology, span but there was still much to be learned about the archeology span at the site. And Ashraf Sadek translated and continued the publication of Ahmed Fakhri's work in 1980. And then we get to the 90s, where Ian Shaw and Robert Jamerson, they had a short visit to Wadi al-Hudi, and they published it in an article in Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, and they ended up covering a lot of material, and they presented a, a wider understanding of the archaeology of the area, but they did sketch maps and things like this that are surprisingly accurate. They did a really good job. And Rosemary and Dietrich Klim are two geologists who covered mining and gold mining in Egypt and Nubia extensively, and they published on the geology in also the geology in relationship to the archeology. span So there's a full uh, bibliography of previous work that's available on wadialhudi.com. I'll be mentioning this website <laughs> throughout the talk, so you can go check it out there. So the Wadi al Hudi expedition has been busy. We have found 41 sites, uh, well, okay, we have, there's now a total of 41 sites. Ahmed Fakhri started naming the sites when he went there with numbers. So he started at number one and he found 14 sites. And since then, we've continued his numbering system and we're up to site 41. 
And we've done an extensive job. So Kate and Brian have headed up this massive effort to survey and map most of these sites. It's extensive and very impressive work. Um, excavations have been conducted at some of the key mining sites and settlements. And Brian Kramer has moved forward and done remarkable work with all kinds of digital imaging things. Um, the epigraphy work with photogrammetry, RTI, 3D modeling, and some of that you'll see in this talk. And we've also are developing an extensive lab program because we want to understand the artifacts and the material culture at Wadi al Hudi in order to reconstruct the lives of ancient people. So we've doing pottery analysis, animal bones, lithics, geology, plants and charcoal is, is, our, is on the bill for the next season. So we're trying to, to really get a picture of life in Wadi al Hudi. Wadi al Hudi is, is most known because of its unique geology that had an incredible amount of mineral resources, including amethyst, but also gold and other minerals. And particularly the amethyst was found in these quartz veins. And so one of the job of the miners was to extract the amethyst from these veins of quartz. And it was the main motivation for being at Wadi al Hudi. There's another very curious feature of Wadi al Hudi being part of, of the desert. It is, well, naturally it's a very arid landscape and Wadi al Hudi looks like this photograph. It is completely barren. It is this desolate place. It almost looks like the surface of Mars or something. There is no water. And we are very interested in studying the ancient environment at the time. So we have Amr Shahat and the head Wali who are going to join us. Uh, to look at the plant remains and the charcoal remains to reconstruct the environment. And Dr. Catherine Grossman from North Carolina State University has been studying the animal bones. So this will give us a better understanding of the ancient environment, but it was still it was probably very dry, uh, even in the Middle Kingdom. Now for the Middle Kingdom, there's four major sites. One of them is site four. And previously this was mostly thought to be Greco-Roman. And what you see in this photo, the standing architecture is indeed Greco-Roman. But when we got there, we found lots of Middle Kingdom pottery on the ground and these lower walls turned out to be Middle Kingdom. And so it seems that in the Greco-Roman period, there was an effort to reconstruct the walls and uh, open up the mines again. So this is a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting site and Kate Liska has written about it in Egyptian archeology, span it's a great article. And it's from 2018 and it's available also on the Wadi Al-Hudi website. So I highly recommend going to check that out. Uh, but this talk will focus on a cluster here of site five, six and nine from the Middle Kingdom that are most well known for their rock inscriptions. So site five and nine, we can kind of think of this as like a, a kind of a cluster. So five and nine are around a kilometer apart from each other. And in between, High on the hill is site six. And this is an, ep an epigrapher's dream. There are tons of rock inscriptions all over site six. And it seems that soldiers would have sat here to keep guard of the area because you have a great view of site five with its mine and its settlement and site nine with its mine and its settlement. And also the area, the road passing through the wadi and also the road going out to site four, which is this way. So it had a great vantage point and these soldiers would sit and they'd get bored and they'd start writing stuff. So a lot of the rock inscriptions also on uh, site six or some of them are texts, but a lot of them are also figural. They're, they're images and they're quite fascinating. And Brian Kramer's done a lot of work to, to record uh, these inscriptions. Site five will be the focus, but before we get there, we have to talk about a few more things, uh, but this is just to take a look. This is the mine. And these are what most of the open pit mines in Wadi Al Hudi look like. Um, this sand here is fill from, from later flooding and different kinds of activities. So this mine would have been deeper in the Middle Kingdom. And the settlement is on this hill. And it's quite unusual for Egyptian architecture because it's built around this hill, as you can see here. Site nine has a very different structure. It's built in the plain of Wadi Al Hudi. And it's got a rectangular structure that's more familiar with Middle Kingdom architecture, particularly in, in Lower Nubia. A lot of the forts that were built in that area have a kind of a rectangular structure. Um, 
So this also gives a good sense of the architecture at Wadi El-Houdi in terms of building materials. Most of the buildings were made from these rough granitic blocks that Per Storm here, our geologist working with us, has said that most of them are from the mines in different parts of the mines. They would have been brought up during that process. So this is construction related from the mining materials. Um, and this is preserved in some places to around two meters in height. And it was an extensive settlement connected with the mines. And unfortunately, we're not gonna get into it too much uh, in this lecture. We're gonna focus more on site five. So we have a, a solid understanding of chronology at Wadi El Hudi. The rock inscriptions start with Montehochet IV and the 11th dynasty. And they are also a lot of rock inscriptions from the early 12th dynasty, particularly Sinuasrat I. And we have a smattering of inscriptions throughout the uh, later Middle Kingdom, but very few. Uh, and this is incredible because the pottery fits this um, textual based chronology perfectly. Most of the assemblage is from this early Middle Kingdom and there's a very few pots that are available or present from the later Middle Kingdom. So this is a, a great alignment of text and archeology span coming together to help us be pretty solid about the dates. Now we know they were mining amethyst at Wadi El Houdi. In part, we have inscriptions like this one that give the name of the high official who came to Wadi El Houdi on behalf of Mentuhotep IV, so he gets king's name, and says that he's there to mine amethyst. Now the term amethyst in ancient Egyptian is hesmen, and that can be used for other minerals. And so it needs a little bit of corroboration with some of the archeology. span And what we found uh, is quartz processing debris from the secondary processing where they smashed up all this quartz in order to remove the amethyst. And we have, and you can see it nicely here, some of the purple amethyst adhering to the quartz. So it's, it's nicely confirmed where the archeology span helps an understanding of the text. So the administration and, and the crown sent expeditions regularly to Wadi El Hudi to mine amethyst. And some of the rock inscriptions like this one, Wadi El Hudi 6, they give us a little bit of an idea about the kinds of people that would have been mining or involved with mining at Wadi El Hudi. So we have the top, we have a list of different men that would have come from Upper Egypt, from, from Thebes, Elephantine, Komombo, and then a series of administrative officials connected with mining, connected with various desert activities and expeditions that would have come from the capital, Ichitawi near Memphis, the Memphite area. So this gives us a picture of perhaps the types of individuals who would have been at Wadi El Hudi. We also have textual evidence that supports the presence of Nubians at Wadi El Hudi. Two different texts state that, you know, the Nubians from different regions were working in Wadi El Hudi. And we have interesting uh, material culture that parallels this textual information. So Kate Liska wrote an article in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology about the similarity between Nubian and particular C group, architectural design and construction technique that's found at a uh, Nubian settlement site of Wadi El Subua and in Wadi El Hudi with the dry stone architecture. So Kate Liska has found that there's this parallel kind of vertical stacking that can be present at site nine and in Nubia and similar architectural uh, structures. And also this is quite fun. Uh, these windows that people thought initially might have been defensive, uh, Kate is arguing that um, these are not so much defensive as they're part of the walls for different features, light and air and things like that, because they're very low to the ground and it was, these are not strong fortified walls and it was be very logistically difficult to fire bow and arrows from them. So this is another possible parallel with the Nubian settlement of Wadi Sabua. We also have another text that gives us information about the material culture at Wadi El Hudi. This text, Wadi El Hudi 4, which was briefly shown with the Nubian workers, says that um, Nubian, Nubian people, they came to Wadi El Hudi bringing his belongings. So this is a very interesting line in the text. This possibly could suggest that Nubian workers came to Wadi El Hudi with their things, which might have bearing on the material culture and the archeology span that we find at Wadi El Hudi. And this could also maybe 
be a uh, broader um, policy of the administration to have some workers bring some goods with them. So from the text, we've got strong evidence for mining amethyst, that amethyst mining was an administrative run endeavor for the crown, that there are workers from many areas of Egypt, including Upper Egypt and the Memphite area. There's also workers from Nubia. And these workers from Nubia might've had a very active role in building these, uh, these settlements. And further, some of these Nubian workers could have maybe even brought some of their own material goods to the site. So another factor that's very important to think about when we try to understand life at Wadi al-Hudi is the water situation. Okay, so it's very arid and we have looked high and low, we've looked everywhere and we have not found any evidence of wells at Wadi al-Hudi, not even an attempt to start a well uh, for the Middle Kingdom. So there seems to be no wells, no source of water at Wadi al-Hudi, which would have created a logistical problem. So presumably there would have been some kind of transport 35 kilometers from the Nile Valley to the sites at Wadi al Hudi. There would have been regular sort of donkey trains or something like a caravan that would have regularly brought supplies of water to the site. Um, perhaps carried in animal skins, but then you also have the other problem of water storage at the site. So this was an administrative challenge that we can understand through some of the material culture. So this leaves us with several research questions to ask of the archeology. span So we can use the archeology span to understand what it means a little better to get some insights into what exactly administration run mining would have been. We can specifically look at the degree of administrative control over mining and resources. How much did the administration control the amethyst and the mining? How much did they control the water and food and other supplies? Also, what was the relationship between the administration and the workers? Were they separate? Were they mixed together? What happened? And we can look at the lives of these workers. How did they interact with each other? And given that there could be a Nubian and Egyptian workforce, what, what was going on here? What were the interaction between this diverse group of workers? And fortunately, there are significant pottery types and other archeological finds that can help address these questions. So first of all, Pottery is incredibly important for understanding the supply of material goods at an archeological site. And it's particularly important at Wadi al Hudi because no pottery was made on site. There was no water and pottery production requires a lot of water to get the clay workable. Um, so all the pots were brought in from the Nile Valley. So everything was important. So tracking the supply chain of pottery and where it came from and then where it went once it was in Wadi al-Hudi is incredibly informative. So fortunately, we have some idea of where pots came from based on the clay type or geology. So the Nile Valley has one clay type, Nile silt, and this is the silt that's deposited on the banks of the Nile and into the fields, and it's used to make a very common pottery type, Nile silt clay, Egyptian and Nubian pottery is, is made with this. Now, generally it's very hard to identify where Nile silt came from because it's all the same stuff in the flood. So it kind of covers everything from, from East Africa. But um, I've done some petrographic analysis. This is microscopic analysis that looks at the minerals in clay. And I did this at the French Archaeological Institute where they have a wonderful lab. And I saw there were tiny fragments of granitic rock and minerals like biotite that are major components of granitic rock that are found in the Aswan area where you have the cataracts. So this could be an indication that some of these Nile silt pots were maybe from the Aswan area. And there's some indication as we'll go on further that maybe pots came from this, this, this location. But also the Nile silt pottery could have come from many other locations in the Nile. So this has a bit of a question mark around it. Marl A3 and Marl C are a little more clear. So there's this thing called the Vienna system. And this is where ceramicists, they got together in Vienna and they made a, a fabric or a clay typology. And I'm using this clay typology and they call it Marl A3 and Marl uh, C. Marl A3, so Marls are from the limestone. It's from this limestone area in, in most of the Nile Valley and it's weathered from the, um, the cliffs. 
And Marl A3 is connected to Upper Egypt from the Gina area. And it's similar to a lot of the pottery that's used for certain Gina uh, wares today. Marl C is one of the most fascinating pottery fabrics in Egypt. Um, and this fabric is from Lower Egypt. It's generally from the Memphite area. Geologically, it's a little more complex, but most of the Marl C pottery from the Middle Kingdom has been found in Lower Egypt, in the Memphite area, and around the Delta. And this area makes sense in terms of the geology. So we think this has a strong connection to the Memphite region and to Lower Egypt. So tracing where the Nile silt, the Upper Egyptian and the Lower Egyptian pottery is located and how it's used in Wadi al Hudi can be very informative. So we have another important pottery type. This is the Marl C. Zir. It's Marl C. It comes from the Memphite area. And its name, Zir, is one that the ceramicists have used because it looks like the modern Egyptian water jars, the Zirs, that are, are used all over Egypt. They all have this bag shape and they have a flat base. So they could have just sat on the ground. These jars are, they have a porous fabric which helps uh, keep liquids cool, which is another connection to making people think that these are water jars. And they are very, very large. Uh, at a lot of sites, they are roughly between 25 and 75 liters. Unfortunately, we only have fragments uh, at Wadi al Hudi, so we can't do any volume analysis. But just to give you a sense that most probably they're, they're very large. Interestingly, these jars are found at expedition sites all over Egypt. They're found all over the desert. They're found on the Red Sea. They're found everywhere. And most probably they reflect the administration supply to a site. Um, and I think it's important to remember that pots, particularly large jars, were also great containers for goods to be shipped to the site. So this could also reflect the administrative supply of goods. And these could also be great water storage containers. We have Nubian pottery at Wadi al Hudi. Uh, and this pottery is very distinctive from Egyptian pottery. It's made from Nile silk clay, and we'll get into it in a second, but it has a distinctive look. In particular, it's handmade. You can see this kind of smooth appearance of the handmade pot, and it's burnished very strongly. And this is an Egyptian pot, and you can see the lines from being turned on the wheel. And typically, Egyptian pottery is not decorated. You can see tiny bits of a red slip over here. So there would be like a, a light red wash or something like that. But Nubian pottery is often burnished and decorated. So we can see a lot of difference in the way they look and their technological style. So we also have this hybrid uh, sort of imitation wares at Wadi al Hudi. And these are very interesting pots. Um, I wrote about them in an article in 2018. And they're strongly connected to the Aswan area. These are pots where they are, their appearance is both Egyptian and Nubian and their technological style, the way they're made uses both Egyptian and Nubian forming technologies. So this reflects a phenomenon that's relatively popular in the Aswan area. Uh, ceramicists working at Elephantine have written about these pots and so Toja Jelska and Dietrich Rao have written about them. And this is possibly another further connection that maybe some of the pottery at Wadi al Hudi came from the Aswan area. So it's important here that these pots weren't produced in Wadi al Hudi, but the people in Wadi al Hudi wanted these pots. So that's a question that we need to figure out a little bit. So another important thing to think about with pottery is vessel function. So we have storage jars, we have Marl C's ears. We have some Marl A3 pots that are considerably smaller, and we have Nile silt, again, Egyptian uh, jars. So we have these three different types of jars, and seeing how they appear at the site can be informative as to the way things were stored and where they came from. We also have a whole other set of pottery related to cooking, eating, and drinking. Uh, the pottery related to cooking are mostly small bowls and small jars, and we can tell that they're used for cooking because they have regular patterns of soot on the outside where they came into contact with fire. There's bowls for, you know, bowls and plates for eating and small little cups for drinking. So this is the food preparation and consumption aspect of pottery. So now that we've had a brief look at the pottery at Wadi al Hudi, we can turn to site five again. 
So this is just a refresher with the mine and the site. And this is a great image that Brian Kramer made. And this shows some of the architecture. This is around 100 meters. Uh, so Wadi Al Hudi Site 5 has a very limited access. So you have to enter from the area around the mine. So the mine is over here by the entrance. And you go through this part and take this little path going all the way up. It's a little bit steep. And you keep going to here where you encounter this choke point. And you can either go straight and get to a flat area that we call the upper court. Or you can go up to this very secure limited access location we call the upper point that's consisting of three rooms. So the upper point, there's only one entrance and the upper courtyard is still pretty restricted. The rest, the, this area that we call the Northwest area and this area over here is a bit more open. So we have different access to different areas of the site. So we're gonna focus on these three areas, the Northwest area, the upper point and the upper courtyard. Um, these three areas are different in terms of architecture. I think it's pretty clear. You have these small rooms and paths and courtyards, and then a massive courtyard, and then these three more enclosed rooms. And based on their architecture, it seems that they had different functions. And that's something that we wanted to interrogate uh, through our work at Wadi Al-Hudi. So we did several things. The first one is we did detailed surveys. So first we did surveys uh, and then we identified areas that were very important in terms of their artifact density and what they could tell us uh, about the site. So the areas in yellow are complete collection surveys. So we went in with a total station and defined these spaces and they encompass one room, a path and a courtyard between the room and the path and another part of the structures over here and the entire corner of the upper court and this area out here. And these complete collection surveys, once we took the total station points, we collected every single thing. And as you'll see in the next slide, uh, Wadi Al Hudi, particularly site five, is very deflated. So what's on the surface is full of important, um, important remains and important material culture. So normally in the first uh, layer of an excavation, this is a bit not as paid attention to as closely as what's underneath, but at Wadi Al Hudi, the top layer is very informative. So we collected all the materials from there and studied them intensively. And then we did detailed excavations in one housing area in this kind of, or one room uh, here and the space in front of it. And we excavated one room here in the upper point to give us an idea of what was happening. So we start with the excavation at the upper point. And you can see this is a great way to look at deflation. You can see all the pottery and all the material that's visible on the surface. And the deposition at Wadi Al Hudi is rather shallow because the, uh, the expeditions to Wadi Al Hudi to mine amethyst were relatively short. People did not stay for very long. Uh, so the top level is very important. So this is a fantastic 3D model by Brian Kramer. And I encourage everyone to go to wadialhudi.com where Brooke Norton, who is an archeologist who's very important on the excavation, does a lot of great work, has also created this website and is maintaining it and doing our social media. And she's fantastic. And she's put a lot of, of, of work into a beautiful website that displays this, uh, a lot of our 3D models and the, the work Brian Kramer has done that's really, really cool. Um, so one of the rooms here was excavated on the upper point. And during this excavation, it's around 2.25 by two meters in this room, they found an extensive amount of quartz fabric, almost 375 kilos of quartz fragment and quartz debris. You have bags and bags and bags. And this is the, the quartz with the small bit of amethyst adhering to it. And there's some animal bones. Now, anyone who's a zooarchaeologist thinks 200 and 16 animal bones is almost nothing. Uh, and it does attest to the, 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 the smaller amount of material culture. Uh, but the animal bones here were predominantly sheep, goats, and a lesser extent bird and very small amounts of gazelle and fish. And Catherine Grossman is working on the publication of this material. And the pottery was very curious. It's just a mix. There was Nile silt, marl A3, marl C0s, everything is, is mixed in together. 
And we hope for the next season to process and study the finds from the um, UP excavations to understand it better. But we'll revisit the function again in a minute. The upper court, this area has a fascinating material culture. So the upper court, there's a density of material culture along the sides as if there was an intentional effort to keep this area clean. And they were constantly sweeping and pushing everything to the corner. So this is why the complete collection survey stuck to these sides because that's where most of the material culture was. Uh, and a lot of the pottery are marl C ears with small quantities of marl A3. And then in this area, and we'll get to it more towards the end, towards the Northwest area, there were some uh, Nile silt, considerable amount of, of Nile silt pottery found. So, but most of it remarkably is marl C ears. And we also see this area over here. We did a complete collection between the double walls where there were Marl C's ears. And this area that I call the zier dumps, which is probably not the best term for it because it's not actually like they were dumping zeers. It's more like there's a cascading fall of zeers going down the hill. So it seems like people were kind of flinging zeers <laughs> off broken zeers off, off of the edge of the site, uh, or they were trying to carry them and throw them and you have some spillover in between the double walls. But we have a lot of Marl C's ears. We also have quartz processing debris from this secondary processing where they would have had to remove the amethyst from the quartz. So we see that extensively in this area. And I think I just put this in here again because it's so cool. <laughs> I love the 3D models. So this is the area of the zier dump and you can see the double walls and I think this is nice because you can get an, an image of how remarkable this upper courtyard flat area would have been for the entirety of the site. It's not easy to navigate the site, it's rather steep, uh, but this was a rare space that was flat and where you could maybe do activities, meet, do things. So we're not sure of the connection between the upper point and the UC, but it seems pretty clear that the upper court was a place to refine amethyst and it was a central place for Zeers. So this suggests perhaps a center of water distribution, perhaps uh, animal skins or other, other sort of vessels that carried water would have been brought up here and deposited in the Zeers and this may, may have been the central storage area for water. Kate Liska is gonna work more on, on the upper point. So I'll give you a few clues. We think maybe that this Originally, it could have been an area for storage of finished amethyst before it gets sent to the Nile Valley, but maybe later on this became a disposal area for some of the, the activities going on in the upper court and the rest of the site. But we need more analysis to, to fully understand what's happening in the upper, upper the UT area. So now we're gonna to turn to the Northwest area. This area is a very different character. And this gives you a sense of some of the architecture. So you have these individual rooms that are two to three meters, pathways in between these, these rooms. And then outside the room, there's some trash. So it seems like whoever was here, they would sweep the trash to the side and then just kind of throw it over next door. And then areas where some of the stones were removed to make a sort of a courtyard space. And then it was connected with different paths. So series of paths, neighboring housing units, rooms, little trash areas and courtyards. So this is the architectural structure of this space here. Now, Nicholas Brown, who is a former AUC master student is now doing his PhD at UCLA. He excavated one of the housing areas for site five and we're still in the works of processing this material, but so far, it is an incredibly different assemblage from what we find in the upper court. We find animal bones, and Catherine Grossman has looked at these, and the most prominent animal bones that we find are gazelle uh, with small amounts of, of fish, which is very interesting. Maybe it was brought in from the Nile Valley in some kind of container, so pottery becomes important again. Uh, it's like a salted or dried preserved fish, some bird, and very minimal sheep goat. There is also, um, charcoal that's found in this area. And this could be related to cooking or fires to keep warm. And then there's stone tools. This is a flint that would not have been local to Wadi al-Fudi. It would have had to have been brought. So this indicates that there's cutting activities going on. 
that could be related to cooking or other activities. And then these are fun. They're a really great tool. They're called, we call them, people can either call them pottery tools or worked sherds. It's a pottery sherd that at some point somebody picked up and they used it for scraping activities. So it's completely scraped down to a point. So some kind of repetitive scraping action. So this gives a picture of a lot of daily life activities, perhaps cooking, eating, scraping, chopping. So there could be the scraping and chopping could be associated with food preparation or maybe small scale craft production to, to make some goods they need or repair some items they already have. And the gazelle bones are also very interesting. It could point to maybe there was a, a degree of hunting that took on, took place in the, in, in the area and that the, these animals were consumed in the Northwest area. And in terms of the pottery, the assemblage is very, very, very different. We have a lot of plates, bowls, jars, so lots of, of food consumption of Egyptian pottery, a lot of Nile silt. And we have a lot of uh, cooking pottery. And interestingly, the cooking pottery is small. It's these small sort of bowls. And the Nubian pots are also used uh, as, as cooking pottery as well. So cooking is happening and food consumption is happening in this area. And the cooking is not big vats for large amounts of people, but smaller. Uh, cooking activities. And we also have these imitation wares that are found in the Northwest area. So this seems to point to a very different activity set than the upper court. And to give you an idea of some of the differences, um, I've compared the uh, distribution of pottery fabrics, the frequencies on the surface surveys between the upper court and the Northwest area. Um, it's hard to compare the excavated material to the surface survey of the upper court. But it's even to compare the, the, the surface surveys. And from the surface survey, there's a large section is Marl C. And then we have some Marl A3 jars. So these are all zeros. All the Marl C are zeros. Uh, some Marl A3 jars and a few small cups, some Nile silt jars. And these are mostly from the areas that border the Northwest area. So it's not from the central part of the upper court. And there are no Nubian pots. In the Northwest area, conversely, there are three Marl C uh, jar fragments. And again, those are from the upper area of the Northwest area that borders the upper courtyard. There's a little bit of Marl A3, and these are mostly small, small little cups and a few, a few jars. And an overwhelming assemblage of Egyptian Nile silt and Nubian pottery is also present uh, at this, this area. So we do see a vast difference in between these two spaces. So we can have some tentative ideas and tentative conclusions based on this material on what it was like in Wadi Al-Hudi and the administration and the provisioning. So first, looking at provisioning. So we can see we've got all the different pottery types. And in the upper court, it's very clear. It's mostly Marl Sea coming from the Memphite area. So this area is receiving supplies and from the Memphite area, and it is possibly a water storage facility for the, 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 for the entire site. So it's mostly Memphite with some upper Egyptian and a little bit of Nile silt. The Northwest area, on the other hand, it has Nile clay, Nile silt clay coming from potentially Aswan and potentially other areas. It has Nubian pots, and these could be the pottery, the things that Wadi al Hudi inscription four refers to as Nubians coming and bringing their things, or they could have been supplied by whoever was supplying the site. It could be the individuals or perhaps the administration. But when we think about it and, and, and look at the assemblage, the assemblage of pottery in the Northwest area is incredibly diverse. So this points to more sources of material, it, it points to different lines of supply and points to less control over the types of pottery that are seen here. Whereas in the upper court, it is basically all Marl C zeers and a few Marl A3 jars, and that's about it. Um, we also have some of the upper Egyptian pottery found in this area too, in small jars and, 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 and uh, small, small cups. So we see, the Memphite area really supplied this, this spot, 
And then the rest of the Nile Valley and the Aswan area uh, supplied this, this spot. So we see two different lines of supply at this spot. We also can infer from the material culture, it gives us some kind of clues as to what the administration did and their main concerns at Wadi al-Hudi. First and foremost, they were there to mine amethyst. They, it's clear in the inscriptions, it's clear from the mines, it's clear from everything that that was their chief concern. And so it is logical what we, what we find in the archeology span where there was a considerable amount of administrative control over amethyst and its secondary processing, the processing of removing amethyst from quartz. And this took place in the flat area of the upper courtyard that was rather restricted and potentially stored in the upper point. So there was centralized control over this amethyst processing and amethyst storage. Now we don't find any amethyst in the Northwest area. It's not found at all. So everything involved in amethyst was kept up here. It went from the mine over here all the way to the upper court. And it seems that this control extends to some of the Marl Caesars. And we have to think about Marl Caesar function. Maybe they brought in supplies from the capital, in which case maybe the supplies were offloaded here. It's not very clear, but they most probably had a water storage function. So presumably this area also stored water for the activities of the site. And then water was distributed to the people in the Northwest area and stored in these smaller, more manageable Nile silt jar forms. So there seems to be some kind of administrative control and distribution to the workers in this area. Now this distribution could have extended to other foodstuffs like grains and things like that. And we're eagerly awaiting um, Amr Shahat to come and study some of the, the, the plant remains to give us a better idea of what's happening. So this could extend beyond water to other sort of food goods. But yet at the same time, when we think about the lives of the workers, it shows us that perhaps the administration was not this monolithic entity that controlled everything. That at site five, there was a degree of independence for these workers. In terms of their food preparation, they were cooking and preparing food in the Northwest area. There was no large kitchens. There were no centralized cooking area, nothing like that. They were cooking in small quantities and eating. And whether they got some of the, the, the food that they were cooking from the administration is unclear, but they were certainly preparing it and eating it in the spot. And that's outside of some of the norms that you would see in, in larger scale work projects. There also could have been an access to their own goods. There was certainly an access to, to hunting. So there was some gazelle. And potentially if Wadi al Hudi inscription four is to be understood uh, the way that we kind of understand it is that workers, Nubian workers and perhaps other workers could have brought their own goods. Maybe the workers were in charge of some of their own provisions. They could bring pots with them from home, bring some goods with them from home. But either way, there is an incredible amount of variability in the pottery types uh, that is found in the Northwest area. So they do have different supplies, a different chain of supply, a different, different everything going on than the administrative central point in the upper court. And there could be some of their own small scale crafting, making goods for themselves or repairing their own personal goods. So there does seem to be a life that's almost a community that's made in this area where there, you can imagine it being kind of lively where everyone's cooking and eating and talking and doing stuff. And in this spot, away from the major administrative center to some degree. Now we have another important research question that we're at the start of trying to understand is Nubians at Wadi al Hudi. The texts say Nubian workers were there. Uh, the material culture and the archaeology and the architecture supports this idea as well. So the Nubian pottery, though, is interesting because we don't find it zoned within any specific area in the Northwest area. Nubian pottery and Egyptian pottery are intermingled and used throughout this entire space. There seems to be no pattern with Nubian versus Egyptian pottery. Uh, likewise, if you can think of these areas as little clusters where people would gather, work, cook together, hang out together, there seems to be 
Nubian and Egyptian workers side by side. And this gives us a very interesting set of questions to think about when it comes to identity at these short-term expeditions, where at this site, it seems like there was an identity that moved beyond, I'm from this area of Egypt or I'm Nubian, but they were all in the Northwest area, cohabiting and co-working together. So it gives us a chance to see how workers organized themselves and created their own identities. And I'm excited for our work that will hopefully uh, elaborate on this much more. Um, so thank you everyone for attending this talk. And I encourage you all to go to wadiyalhudi.com and follow us at Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And thank you so much to everyone who's been a wonderful part of our team and helped us with our work. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brent Meredith, um, for this fascinating presentation and uh, for um, giving, us the giving us the opportunity to uh, better discover the work of uh, the great team that you co-direct. It's, uh, it's amazing and it's all the more amazing that, I mean, you can bring a lot of information up with, you know, tiny materials, I would say, but not, you know, the big monumental thing, but it, it's, it, it's amazing. So I think there are already uh, some okay. question. Well, uh, I'll just mention before and say that this kind of shows what you, information you can get when you have a team that works on a lot of stuff and we sit and we talk and we cooperate so that normally a ceramicist wouldn't be tapped into everything, but every, we can all talk like this and it's fantastic. It gets great results. And I think Brian and Kate and, and I, have, we're, we're really trying to encourage this connection between the different disciplines. Well, yeah, and, and it's, it's, I mean, it's important to have interdisciplinary um, team uh, nowadays, uh, but the fact that you take the time to sit and to discuss your respective finding um it's also i think something that we should uh, learn from um so do you want me to read the question or do you want to read the question and then and then answer them i can read the question and okay. answer them so uh so the first one from rowena baker is i've only read about wadi al hudi uh, but wondered if your findings indicate other middle kingdom amethyst mines in the eastern lower nubia or similar size and function okay this is a great question so Wadi al Hudi is part of a larger mining program that was going on in the Middle Kingdom in the Eastern Desert and around Nubia. So there's big sites like Al Hasmin, East and West, that we have also surveyed. They were part of um, our, our area for the excavation. And there were large mines. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly, but probably amethyst mines. And there's Dihmit North and South that are now right on the border of Lake Nasser. And these are also Middle Kingdom mines. And what they're mining there is potentially less, less clear. But there was a large effort in the early Middle Kingdom to mine minerals and resources from the Eastern Desert and Lower Nubia. So Wadi al Hudi is, is part of this, this process. And there are some of them are similar size, some of them are even bigger, uh, but similar size. Yeah, so large, large spaces. Next question. Okay, so Serena. Nicolini, I love this question. Thank you. Uh, so have you found evidence of pot marks on pottery shirts? Well, yes, we have from the most Middle Kingdom pot mark shirts you can find from the Marl C's ears. Uh, pot marks on Marl C's ears are an infinitely fascinating uh, topic. And it's something that has further led some to argue that there's a connection with the administration because there are pot marks and pot marks are uh, markings incised in the clay, uh, well, there's pre-fired and post-fired. So the pre-fired ones are incised when the clay is wet and then post-fired ones are where it's scratched on afterwards. So we do have some, um, I have a picture, one of these. Anyways, yes, here's one. So I think I've got this covering it. Um, so here's, a, here's one of the pot marks. Uh, so we have quite a lot of pre-fired pot marks and they're commonly found on Marl C's ears and we don't really fully understand the function of these pot marks. There are some people that think that there's, you know, they're made 
they're, they're identifying steps in the manufacturing process. In the workshop, some people think that there are signs to indicate uh, what was contained in the jars, but then the problem is a lot of coverings of these jars would have, there would have been something that would have covered this, so people couldn't have maybe seen it in shipping. Maybe it was something that after the pot was made, it was moved to an area to be filled with goods. And this was an indicator of where it goes within the workshop. So this is a big point of research, but yes, we have pot marks on marl seed. We also have some post-firing pot marks, some kind of doodles, if you will, where people just kind of scratch some stuff onto pottery shirts. So we have, we have that as well. Um, we have another question um, about the cemetery. Did you find any cemetery or at least some tombs? Yes, no. So yes, this is a great <laughs> question and no, we have not. <laughs> Let me be clear. No, we have not found any tombs in the area at all. Um, one of the things that we have been looking for are tombs, but no. And perhaps one of the reasons is that we are, you know, Wadi al Hudi is so close to the Nile Valley, 35 kilometers would have been enough to return people to the Nile Valley where they presumably would have wanted to be, preferred to be buried, preferred to be buried. So that could be why we haven't found any, any, any cemeteries. Or for the hopeful ones, maybe there was no death at Wadi al Hudi. <laughs> um. So question from um, our beloved Lisa. Um, why was the early Middle Kingdom so interested in amethyst? And does the expedition have thoughts about this? Yes, this is a point that uh, Kate Liska and Brian Kramer have talked about extensively. Um, so I'm gonna kind of <laughs> paraphrase from some of their, their ideas. Uh, this, well, there's been a, a considerable debate as to why this would be. We have some ideas. One is that this was kind of the ultimate in, in luxury goods at the time because there was no purple before amethyst was in circulation. So to have this luxury, luxury item that could have had potentially very strong uh, religious symbolism was very important. Uh, Brian Kramer has found things in the coffin text that could potentially allude to this and some of its functions, uh, perhaps for religious reasons. So we range from its uh, luxury economic good that the pharaoh would have wanted to give uh, to his closest relatives and companions and courtiers to religious ideas uh, as well. So we're kind of volleying back and forth with that. And they're better to answer that question. That's a great question. So the next question, I'm not sure whether it's a, a genuine question or an inside. It's uh, Brian Kramer, one of the co-directors. So Magda is one of our team members who has, she works on Nubian cemeteries and she very much has been looking for them and is quite disappointed every season when we don't find a tumulus. So he was making a joke. Okay, okay good. Um, a question from uh, Mathilde Prévost. Did you find any archaeological remains of donkeys? This is another good question. Uh, I don't think so. Everything that we found from the animal bones, I have to go check with this because Catherine Grossman is, is, is in charge of this, but most of it is, you know, there's sheep, goat, there's gazelle, there's fish, birds, things like this. I don't think there are any donkeys, um, but I'd have to check. Uh, it would be very interesting and presumably donkeys would have been present um, on the site because they would have needed to move things around and you know things like that. So presumably there would have been donkeys. Uh, we've excavated um, other locations at you know site four in the Middle Kingdom and site nine. And so maybe the zooarchaeological analysis of some of those materials might lead some more information. Okay, so for now, no dead humans, no dead donkeys. Good point for you. Yes. Um, next, <laughs> next question from um, Susan Allen. So before I read the, que the question, I'm, I'm allowing myself, myself to send my love to Susan and Jim. So one of your slides showed that is usually called a corrugated neck bottle in Middle Kingdom pottery. It wasn't clear if it was Nile or Marl. Yes. So this is the one she's talking about. Hello. 
it's nice to, to meet you virtually. I'm a big fan of your pottery work. <laughs> uh, okay, this one. This is, um, this one was, uh, it was Marl A3, this guy. And I'm working hard this summer to do the pottery report and get that published. So you'll have a more kind of proper ceramicist explanation of some of the pottery and the fabrics and the frequencies and things like that. Uh, thank you. So uh, next question from Carol Redmond. What do you know about the workmen, their status, where they came from, apart, apart from what the pottery is telling you? Um, and might this affect how they interacted with each other? Yes, this is a great question. So we do have some of the clues from the text, like inscription Wadi al Hudi 6, that is up here, that says that, you know, there are sort of workmen that presumably had a lower status uh, from the higher officials of, um, let me move this. Uh, so a lot of people that were coming from Upper Egypt to work, uh, and then some more higher administrative officials from the capital. So this could definitely impact the way they would have interacted with each other. And it's something that we, we are very much interested in understanding more. And the way to do this is to fully process the finds at the Northwest area sort of housing unit and to compare it with the finds that we're seeing from the excavations at site nine and site four to understand maybe if there's a difference in the type of goods uh, between these areas and hopefully more detailed analysis on the titles of these individuals would also help. Um, another interesting question is, you know, again, the, the role of, of the Nubian workers and where they fit into this social hierarchy. So the material culture puts these Nubian workers, if you can assign pots to people, which is very difficult, but based on the text and the architectural technique, and the text saying that Nubian workers could have brought their things with them, we can be a little more comfortable placing Nubian pots with Nubian people to some extent, which even that I feel uncomfortable saying, um, but there is a kind of connection. So we could still think that maybe they were in this area too. Um, so that's something that we wanna go forward in the research and to try to answer this question a little more. And I think that a lot of information could be found in the comparison of the titles and combining the text with the archaeological materials of the different sites. Um, Suzelle Allen, just um, react uh, about your uh, answer. So I think it's, it's more personal. So it's for you. It's between two um, ceramicists. Um, just another question. And I, we, I think we have to uh, wrap things up um soon so a question from kathleen mcgann have you found any evidence other than other than the quartz fragments showing that they were or shaped the amethyst on site no and so our working hypothesis is that they would have extracted the quartz from the mine brought it up to the upper courtyard and removed the amethyst from the court. The court's like the amethyst was embedded in it. And then they would have probably shipped that on to the royal workshops to do other processing, most probably. Uh, so we, that's all we have is the separation of amethyst from quartz. Um, uh, comment from uh, uh, Dr. Kate uh, Litzka. Um, I, and she said, I quote, I just checked uh, Kate Grossman's report. We have very limited numbers of donkey and cattle remains but it's super small for uh, any large uh, mammals. So just to answer uh, Mathilde Prevost's um, question or to um, give more um, information on a question. Another question, um, I'm sorry, I just uh, will say the, the, the first name because I'm not sure I will pronounce the last name correctly. So from Asta, do you think people were living constantly in this and other sites uh, of Wadi al like in Jor Medina, or working in amethyst quarries like a seasonal obligation, or maybe working in these quarries was kind of a punishment? Oh, this is a big question for Wadi al -Hudi. And it's difficult to establish this archaeologically because we don't yet have a set of strong theoretical guidelines to identify in material culture what is work obligation versus what is not work obligation. 
Um, because ancient Egyptians, for most of these expeditions, they fed people pretty well. We have a, a, a good evidence at sites like Hittel Grove and Giza, where there is extensive, you know, food and, and people were well fed, you know, broken bones were mended, things like that. So there is a degree of care given to people. So we need to think more about the way that we would identify any kind of enforced labor uh, or work obligations in the archaeological record. And the text from what I think at Wadi al Hudi don't make it super clear, but seasonal obligations would make sense with the seasonal nature of the mining expeditions, that they were there for shorter periods of time to get a bunch of stone and then to go. So that would, it would be logical given the prevalence of seasonal obligations uh, in a lot of, 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 of work in, in ancient Egypt and also in, um, in, in, you know, it, this was a very common, common way of organizing, organizing work and labor and it fits with the expedition patterns at Wadi al-Hudi. So probably. <laughs> um, last question. Uh, um, myself, I'm not sure if it was answered uh, already from Christina Alou. Um, so were there workshops like for jewelry to process, process the amethyst inside five? or was it, was it crafted elsewhere? Ah, uh, yeah, so I think we, we just answered this. So it, it was crafted elsewhere, probably in the Royal Workshops. And so the debris that we have from amethyst is amethyst processing, where it is uh, removing the amethyst from the quartz. And presumably the finer bead making and amulet making and things like that would have taken place in, in the Nile Valley Workshops. Um, a comment from uh, Brian Kramer um, saying the texts are actually ambiguous and only one mention Nubian uh, slaves, but uh, most others uh, list professional classes of uh, workers. So it so was about administrative people, but you know, there could have been seasonal occupation. Yeah, so the texts are ambiguous to this. I have my own question. Um, I mean, I, I've translated with my student in hieratic uh, one text from Atnub, and um, there was an important activity there at the end of the 11th dynasty and the beginning of the 12th dynasty. And the um, epigraphic uh, activity there um, gives us uh, information on the dynamics between the monarchy and uh, the nomarchs. Um, what about uh, the inscription in Wadi El Udi? Do you have information for reconstructing historical context in Upper Egypt or, or even in Nubia? What was the dynamic between, you know, at this, at this time, um, the monarchy was not, uh, I mean, was just beginning to recover. So, do you have inscription where you can say that some ex expedition uh, were sent by Nomark and Nomark took over basically um, the production of amethyst or at least the mining of amethyst or is this just um, a, a, a royal endeavor? Okay, I will answer this and I'm going to ask Brian Kramer to type something to confirm it because he's our tech specialist. <laughs> so, Brian, get ready to type. Um, so, uh, it seems that from all the inscriptions that, that, that people were sent in the Middle Kingdom by the crown, that it's not monarch, monarchs. And also Susan Allen, yes, this is, it's, it is model A3 and it does seem to be some kind of an imitation. We've only found one and it's kind of cool. So I put it in the slide, but it's our only, only one of them. So it is kind of a unique pot, but that's a, a really like important observation. Thank you. So um, Kate Litska uh, answered, they are all pharaohs, no nomarchs, and uh, Brian Kramer also answered, all texts are official inscription with loyalist overtones, but I have noticed that most Mantuotep the fourth texts are either effaced or, co or covered uh, over later. Uh, all later texts are unusually left intact. So, okay, so uh, a, a royal endeavor for uh, Wadi al um, yeah. I don't know, I, there doesn't seem to have, oh yeah, uh, Claire Somaglino, well, 
She's, she's excavating, uh, I think she's the director of the Ain Sorda mission on the Red Sea. Uh, it's uh, more or less uh, a call uh, for um, discussion between Wadi Aloudi and uh, Ain Sorda. So now you are uh, in contact. Uh, well, I know Claire and I know you, so I can, uh, I can be the connection between you two. That would be great, and bring you know Kate, uh, Liska, and Brian Kramer, and and let's have more talks about this. It's a mining sites are incredibly fascinating. I mean, endlessly for the inscriptions, the archaeology, the glimpse at life. It's like wonderful. So uh, thanks, Antlia. So voila, I can uh, I can put you in context. So I think it's it's uh, time for us to wrap things up. I don't know uh, if Daniele is still. Uh, there and if he can uh, show uh, his face uh, because it's uh, it was um, uh, our last uh, event for this series of AUC Egyptology Zoom lecture. So on behalf of uh, Professor Ikram and uh, the young baby of AUC that that is us, um, <laughs> I would like to thank you everybody who attend to our um, events uh, and uh, I hope there's going to be more uh, to come uh, because it seems that it was quite uh, a success. Thank so thank you, you everybody. I don't know if you want to add things but go ahead. No, thank you so much everyone for coming to the talk. I greatly enjoyed it. Thank you all for hosting. <laughs>